Hello and welcome to Daily Debrief. I am Siddhant Ani and I am coming to you from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. It's great to be back on the show after a couple of days break with Prashant as always. Today we are talking about Pakistan, uh, actually South Asia. We are also talking about an update from COP26 and perhaps some decent news for journalists around the world. Uh, first up, Pakistan, where on Sunday the government withdrew the ban on the right-wing extremist political party Tariq e Labak Pakistan, the TLP. This comes shortly after a deal was struck between the government and the TLP after the week of violent protests, as that party staged a march from the city of Lahore towards the capital Islamabad. Prashant, first up, uh, who are the TLP and why were they banned in the first place? Right, uh, Siddhan, so the TLP is an extremist organization of a particular sect, largely dominated by members of the sect called the Barelvi sect in Pakistan. These are Muslims, of course. Uh, this sect, of course, characterized by the fact that this sect and this party, not so much a sect, but this mm. party specifically mm -hmm. characterized by the fact that they have focused over the past years a lot on the idea of blasphemy. Right. Now, it's important to understand this because over the past many years in pa Pakistan, we have seen a huge attack on minorities, not only Christians, but even Ahmadi Muslims, for instance, mm. on the issue of blasphemy. So anybody who is, you know, considered to uh, speak or say something which is against, uh, you know, divine will or divine sayings is automatically accused of it. There's usually this huge uh, social witch hunt kind of a campaign. People are attacked. People are sometimes, many, many people are persecuted in court. Some of them actually receive sentences, some others are acquitted but at a loss, a loss, lot of loss. So right. the TLP <clears throat> is one of these parties which has over the past few years really capped, uh, mobilized on this basis. Mm. And they've issued threats, they've made number of demands. One of their first major demands was over what was blasphemous in the oath of parliamentarians for mm. instance. Mm. Recently last year after this Charlie Hebdo controversy in France mm. with Emmanuel Macron made some comments about that controversy. It's a separate story altogether. Yeah. This party started mobilizing, demanding the expulsion of the French embassy from Pakistan. Now, as you know, it's a demand which uh, no government can <laughs> reasonably uh, accept. Except. But nonetheless, the protests continued. In April, there was a lot of violence. The party leader was arrested and the party was banned at that time. Right. So now what happens in October is that following a court decision which says that the party leader should, uh, detention is perhaps illegal. The TLP launched a massive protest and they began marching from Lahore to Ahmedabad. Mm -hmm. Right. Lahore. So these are one of the, maybe some of the two most important cities in Pakistan. This is the heartland of Pakistani politics. Right. Right. So the march was announced from Lahore to, uh, Lahore to Islamabad. There was a lot of violence on the way. Police officers were killed, vandalism, all kinds of violence. The police were not really able to stop this kind of protest because from the government side, there was a lack of clarity on how they wanted to handle this mm. because they were afraid of, uh, say, going all out against them because that will like, actually make more martyrs. On the other hand, uh, the political system in Pakistan has been so completely destroyed that the mm. government didn't really have any credibility to take a lot of action either. Right. So, they were, they had, the rangers, which are a paramilitary force, was deployed. They too were not very effective. Mm. And finally, as it seemed like this huge march would actually take over the capital city, the government was forced to you know, make what looks like a very humiliating compromise. So, right. within a few days, about around 2,000 activists were released. The parties, was, which was banned in April, is going to be probably unbanned again. Will be allowed to participate, and the leader might, <clears throat> sorry, soon be released as well. Mm. So, this actually uh, is an indicator that this takes place in the heartland, in the core of Pakistan's polity. Mm. Really shows how far extremism. And uh, religious fundamentalism has progressed in the country yeah. and how it is able to take the country at ransom at such short notice because mm. <clears throat> this was October 22nd, I believe the protest started right. and within seven, eight days, you know, the so government that. was just completely forced to surrender. Mm. Now, the fact, of course, is that in Pakistan, the army is also a key player. It is yeah. like the state behind the state, so to speak. Yeah. Even they, I think, were sort of not really sure how to respond. So, in the future, we might see attempts to, you know, uh, reduce the effectiveness of the party, the army might intervene in various ways. Mm. But what this is left is the, look, the government really looks in a very bad position. Right. So, obviously, from what you're saying, uh, and as many other commentators have also pointed out, this is a bit of a de uh, defeat for the government in that sense, Imran Khan's government in Pakistan. Uh, what, what do you make of the broader political picture? Right. So, I think there's a larger question of really uh, paralysis as far as this government is concerned. In general, in, general, in Pakistan's polity itself, it's mm. fairly well known that this government was, you know, pretty much the instrument of the army. 
Right. While there are differences between the government and the army, like yeah. in any situation in Pakistan. Yeah. Nonetheless, the credibility of this government is very low. Its COVID-19 handling was not particularly great. It is, you know, been in, it's used a series of policies which are not brought any economic relief to the people of Pakistan. Mm. So this, uh, all uh, the, 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 the so <clears throat> sorry. So it has done a series of economic policies which has not brought any relief to the people of Pakistan. So this leaves governments like these, for instance, many other parts of the world also extremely vulnerable to attacks from the right, like this kind of an attack, you know, where a religious uh, organization, a fundamentalist organization is able to use or mobilize around a particular issue. Now, maybe in Europe, it might be a hatred towards immigrants. Maybe in a country like Pakistan, it's hatred towards blasphemers. In right. India, it's an entirely different thing. Yeah. So this uh, leaves certain governments actually very vulnerable to these kind of attacks and they end up with actually much less credibility. That's one aspect. Mm. On the other hand, what happens is for these kind of extremist parties, an agreement like this is a huge boost yeah. because it's a massive validation yeah. of their political power. And their for, stance. Exactly. And for people, for instance, who are on the sidelines, who are potential converts to the mm. cause of these parties, mm. victories mm. like these actually indicate that the government and the establishment and the state are not able mm. to, you know, Effectively take a strong counter. stand. Yeah. And actually, it provides a huge moral boost for these kind of organizations. Mm. Now, it's important, for instance, to contrast this with the Pashtun movement in the northern part of Pakistan. Mm. Now, if you take a look at that movement, that movement has been arguing for peace. It has been arguing that landmines should be uh, withdrawn, mm. uh, you know, taken away from their regions. Yeah. It has been arguing for, you know, many people have been disappeared. It has been arguing for justice for them. Mm. But there has been a constant attack on the leaders of this movement. Recently, one of their prominent leaders, Ali Wazir, mm. was indicted for sedition, along right. with many other members of the organization. So this is your pe people see on these. On the one hand, you have progressive movements, movements seeking justice being criminalized, mm. and on the other hand, we have movements which are seeking some of these most extreme demands mm. in the name of religion. Yeah. They are actually being indulged. So this becomes a ho huge message for not only people, but also for law enforcement. Yeah. So for instance, tomorrow people in the state, yeah. the police, the army, the bureaucrats, all of them see that this is a political system which is willing to cave in at the. Uh, at the shortest provocation, mm. at the slightest provocation. Mm. So they're also likely to, you know, not take approach, issues a, in approach, that approach differently. So yeah. as a whole, agreements like this, very bad for the society of Pakistan, very bad for progressive people in Pakistan, very bad for those who want, you know, some kind of social justice and equity because once the temperature, so to speak, changes, once society shifts so drastically towards the right, it's very difficult to bring it back. And I think that's one of the realizations we've all had, mm. that if you want a society where there's justice, where there's equity, where there's equal treatment for all irrespective of their identities, mm. there has to be a strong state which actually maintains that balance, right? But when the state is giving in, when the state is defeated, when the state is, you know, a prisoner of such kind of interests, then it has a very bad impact on society. Yeah, for sure. And we're moving on, uh, but we're sticking in the region, moving on to India. Well, it's been five years since the government led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi scrapped high-value 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, leading to overnight panic and trauma for millions of Indians across the economic spectrum. While the government's aims included the end of corruption, tax evasion and black money, the hardest hit, as always, were the poorest. I had the opportunity to travel during that time on the road from the capital New Delhi down to the southern state of Karnataka and back up through central India. And to me, it looked like there was, it was a complete self-made uh, disaster. Uh, five years on, Prashant, the aims of this sudden move that and drastic move by the BJP government, uh, were they achieved at all or have they, has there been progress towards that? Good question, Siddharth. Actually, I think it's important for people across the world to really, you know, let this sink in. That yeah. on, the, on November 8th, you have the Prime Minister of India going up on TV mm. and suddenly declaring that these high value notes, 500 and 1000, which are, you know, vital for so many people, not only the rich or the middle class or whatever, even yeah. poor people are essentially invalid. Not they valid do, they do not have any yeah. tender, you know, validity and you have to return them to the banks, mm. right, and collect maybe its alternatives. Mm. And that was a shock. I remember watching it in the newsroom. Everyone, was, nobody was prepared for this. And it is clear that the government itself was not prepared, mm. right. So over the next months, we had people having long queues in banks. There are many people who are confirmed to have died in these queues, yeah. waiting to withdraw money. Just imagine in 2016, mm. people died waiting in queues to withdraw money, which was theirs. It's not money. even yeah, no, it's you know, somebody not, else's it's, money. It's, yeah. It was their money. And they had to, they died. Around 100 people, five people in total are supposed to have died. Some of them cases of suicide as well because mm. of you know depression and all that. But 
This was a shock that was rendered to India's economy. Later, numbers proved that the economy actually shrunk, contracted because of that. Now, the important question is, were the aims met? Mm. The, some of the major aims, like you said, were, you know, this would combat black money mm. and this would combat counterfeit notes and mm. this would combat terrorism. Mm. Whereas what actually happened was, of the total value of notes that were of these two denominations that were there in India at that time, I think close to 99% was returned. Right. Right. Which means that the idea that there was this huge black money, which, you know, black money, which was in cash in people's mm. hands. Mm. You know, and there were these illegal scamsters who were mm. maybe renting Falling. buildings with notes. Yeah, yeah. That is completely false because 99% of those cash, you no, know, those notes came back to the government. Mm. Right. And so the question really was at the end of the day, of a matter, counterfeiting estimates were always that, always that counterfeit notes were a very, very minuscule percent. I think 0.0027% mm. or something, which is mm. almost nothing. Mm. But the economic impact that demonetization had, it is impossible to talk about in terms of, it described in terms of day-to-day -day life, the mm. uncertainty people faced, the trauma they underwent, the long queues, and the economic, larger economic impact also. So the question was, if none of this had any impact, I mean, I'll give a very simple example, you know, take the, the, repl the replacement was supposed to be a 2,000 rupee note. Now, for secrecy purposes, the government decided that it would not start printing the new notes until they announced the withdrawal of the old ones. Right. Right. So what happened was, you know, they were supposed to be the new notes, but they were actually not printed. Mm. And later it turned out that the new notes that were printed could not be fit in your ATM machines. Mm. So they all the, every ATM machine in India had to be had to recalibrated. Be every ATM machine in India. That was the extent of chaos which, uh, you know... The people had to endure. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's this whole thing about later as they realize, as the government realized that you know, all this was not, all this logic was not working. They said our idea was also to make it a less cash economy. Mm. Whereas I think the latest reports show that the amount of cash in the country is pretty much the same. Right. So none of these agenda items seem to have worked, but there was a huge publicity campaign. Mm. That's about it. Mm. So how is the government marking this five years or is there any sort of uh, recognition at all of this step having been taken and the kind of impact it had? Right. So good question, because I think that, uh, you know, I don't know the government is really enthusiastic about this so much these days because mm. I think internally they've kind of figured there's this whole narrative of, you know, we fought black money. So ultimately all this did was create a narrative, Right. you know, as the BJP government has been doing over the past, it helped make this whole narrative of the government fighting corruption, the mm. government fighting black money, mm. the government fighting. And these are issues Indians are concerned about. So yeah. that's one reason it struck a chord because people were initially, you know, even while suffering, people went about saying that, okay, this, this is for is the country, good, yeah. you know, this is for a cause. Think of the soldiers who are fighting. That we, are, we are waiting in the lines just like that. That's mm. how people defended this. Mm. You know, our waiting on a, in front of an ATM is like a soldier at the border. Mm. That's how people defended this. Mm. But... When in hindsight, you look at the numbers later and you see that there was really no impact at all, that all the so-called supposed aims were, you know, just bluster. Yeah. And all this did was to create a narrative. So this, I think, indic and this is a very good metaphor maybe for how this government has functioned. There's an insane amount of focus on building narratives, very little concrete achievements, mm. you know, and a lot of twisting of uh, the narrative around this. So one important thing to note is that the Indian media especially the TV media played a disgraceful part, part during this whole thing because they went all out praising the government for this decisive, bold step mm. without asking the necessary questions. Some media did and the evidence was there all over. For instance, bank employees, unions were saying that this was a bad idea once it was announced. Until then, nobody knew. Yeah. You know, And say, farmers groups were saying that it was a bad idea. Every vulnerable group in India was saying that this was a bad idea. But a large sections of the TV media just went about saying, Master stroke, you know, the government has defeated black money in, in one, one single fell vote. swoop. Yeah, exactly, yeah. one fell swoop. Yeah. So really, I think uh, this 2016 decision, uh, of course, the 105 families, the many others who suffered in various ways, yeah. the economy as a whole, but I think also very important metaphor for how this government has been functioning. Absolutely. Right, we're moving from there on to day nine of COP26, uh, the COP26 uh, climate talks in being held in Glasgow in the United Kingdom. And we're in the final phase of what I suppose are very serious and very intense negotiations there. Uh, Prashant, what is uh, the latest? Where are we at? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, there have been some interesting announcements, some important announcements, but the overall consensus is that it is not enough. Hmm. Right. So just to explain quickly, what are we looking at? We're looking at 
trying to reduce the increase in global temperatures right. or keep it limited. Keep it limited yeah. So if we are at uh, the current target is that we want uh, we want to keep a uh, cap the global rise in temperatures at 1.5 degrees, degrees Celsius. from the pre-industrial age. Mm. Okay. Now I think we are already crossed the one degree mark, mm. which means we have a very low um, window. window, so yeah. to speak. And almost a lot of consensus is now emerging around the fact that 1.5 degrees is pretty much going to be impossible. Unrealistic. And it's probably 2 degrees is a more realistic, you know, uh, measure. But even the 1.5 degrees increase or the increase so far, which is not 1.5 degrees yet, has already had disastrous impacts. So we have seen, you know, extreme weather events, hurricane, cyclone, changing in weather patterns, impact on agriculture, inundation of low-lying areas, some islands actually entirely disappearing, you know. The glaciers, of course. So, you know, so much of impact we're seeing. And at the end of the day, uh, when the world leaders are meeting at Glasgow to discuss these issues, the urgency still really does not seem to be there. So mm. there's a lot of feel-good rhetoric that's happened. Mm. People saying, okay, we're going to reduce emissions. We're going to do something about methane, We're going to, which is a greenhouse gas. Yeah. Or we're going to reduce deforestation. But, for instance, right now, a major argument is whether, you know, these targets should be, every country has a target. Mm. Now, these targets should be revisited annually mm. or every five years. So, mm. until now, it's been five years. So, right. the last round was in Paris in 2015. That yeah. is the Paris Agreement. Right. This is Glasgow 2020, which became 21 because yeah. of COVID. So, some countries are saying that, you know, we should be able to return to this every year. So, that people, you know, everyone knows that what's happening. Country should, it should not be just voluntary. Country should report yeah. what is being done in to, to reduce carbon emissions. Mm. Because it's a global problem. It's sure. not that, uh, say... You can the emissions of the US of are only about the US. Yeah. The emissions of the US are endured by Bangladesh, mm. for instance, or the island nations in the Pacific. Yeah. Right. So, uh, even I think uh, right now, still uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty over some of these key <clears throat> demands. Various countries have announced net zero, which is uh, balance between your emissions and your efforts at uh, removing carbon for various dates. For instance, mm. uh, China has done 2060, some of the more developed nations which are better placed have done until 2050, have announced 2050, India's around 2070. Mm. But even then, it looks very unlikely that, you know, first implementing them is going to be a huge problem. Mm. The important thing to note is that in 2015, there was a commitment that there would be $100 billion uh, spent globally uh, to help poor countries actually deal with these yeah. issues. So far, that's not come through. Mm. So that number might come through only by 2023. Right. So a uh, lot of tough questions actually for world leaders, for the people of the world. And uh, the underlying question of justice for all really remaining there. Yeah, sounds like I mean a, a lot, a lot of, uh, and a lot of, uh, as our producer would say, a lot of talky talky, but very little action. Right, exactly. Uh, but so, what are people's movements saying? Because they are also on the ground and they are uh, having counter conversations uh, exactly. at the same time or concurrent conversations. Exactly. Right. For for instance, day before yesterday, that was Saturday, there was a massive march around 100 to 150,000 people, activists from across the continent, across the world, but across Europe especially, were there, you know, from various causes, indigenous movements, trade unions, leftist political parties, youth mm. movements, all of them with a variety of demands, but, you know, uh, coming, centering on one single point, that this, there has to be systemic change really to address this issue, yeah. right? For instance, if you look at, I think, that I believe the G20 countries mm. contribute about 80% of these mm. emissions. And if you take those G20 countries and look at per capita, what is the extent of the emissions? Mm. Uh, in the United States, it's much, much, much higher than any other country in the world. Mm. Right. But what exactly is the, US, is the US doing? Joe Biden came to Glasgow with, I believe, 80 cars. Right. right. So he's been asking for increase in, increase in oil production. So how exactly do you square these uh, big arguments that are being made, big claims that are being made with uh, the necessity? So... People's movements have been demanding that there has to be strict systemic change, there has to be structural change, that the promises that are being made need to, uh, say, be kept. You know, the promises that are being made need to be kept, especially in terms of money, especially in terms of the rich countries taking responsibilities. In terms of, for instance, frontline communities, we're right. talking about indigenous communities, we're yeah. talking about people living near, uh, say, places where the impact of climate change is the most, mm. the suffering of these people needs to be mitigated. Including places like Florida and the US. Exactly. It's not just the yeah, global yeah. south. It's yeah. also places in the global north. Yeah. But but predominantly in the global south. Of course. Yeah. Right. So uh, that these places, uh, you know, there has to be mitigation of the uh, suffering that they're having. That these people should have a voice at the table. Mm. You know, it just can't be the big countries, yeah. the rich countries sort of talking among themselves. Mm. 
and because of their financial power. So uh, somebody, I think Vijay Prashad pointed out very uh, excellently that over the past year during the pandemic, 16 trillion was given as you know, money was raised to actually yeah. fund the emergency of the pandemic. Mm. And that was good because yeah. some of it has went to the people. A lot of it went to big capital. Big, a lot of it went to corporations. Mm. Let's be honest about that. Mm. But some of it went to the people. Mm. But it showed that, you know, when the interests of, for instance, big capital was threatened or when the interests of the big industrialists was threatened, governments rose to the occasion and said, okay, here we'll give you money. Mm. So why hasn't that same amount of money been dedicated to climate change? That's yeah. really a question. Yeah. And the people's movements have made this point very clear that that is because the interests of climate, the issue of climate change actually uh, is a blow to the interests of the big industries and the big capitalists. They will suffer if some of these climate change policies are implemented. Mm. So it's one way it's ironic that many of these spons many of the sponsors of this COP26 summit are big corporates. Yeah. A lot of CEOs have come. Yeah. The fossil fuel industry, which is the target, has a yeah. lot of representatives lot. at COP26. Yeah. There's a lot of lobbying going on. Mm. So really the key question here is, you know, there's a, definitely a strong rearguard action being fought by groups which don't really con are not concerned so much about what happens in 2100. Yeah. They're like, we need to extract as much as possible today, mm. right? Mm. And when the crisis of 2100 comes, they will have enough to go to the safer places in the world, yeah. <laughs> even if they have to go to space. Yes. <laughs> right. Which you're already saying, I mean, moves exactly. towards that exactly. being made. I mean. Whereas the bulk of the people yeah. are going to suffer. So I uh, really hope, hopefully the last few days will have a bit more concrete impact. Yeah, and hopefully something less bleak to bring our viewers yeah. as well. Uh, we're moving on now to our last story. Uh, the USAID or USAID, the United, uh, United States' international aid agency announced last week that their government will devote funding to help journalists overseas survive frivolous lawsuits meant to silence them. Samantha Power, the agency's chief, is a former reporter herself and said that President Joe Biden's administration was setting up a global defamation defense fund for journalists as part of his democracy promotion agenda. Uh, Prashant, uh, if I ask you as a journalist what the US could do for you, what would you say? I mean, I don't know about me. If, uh, if you ask them what they could do for journalists, I would have a very simple answer, release, withdraw charges against Julian Assange, mm. <laughs> right? Because it is, uh, you know, in this section of our show, we have a lot of news items which are ironic. This yeah. is this is a right up there on top because on the one hand, you have the United States saying we want to protect journalists and then it is filed 18 charges against Julian Assange, a journalist who revealed, who helped democracy, who put information out there which helped democracies across the world. For instance, the information by WikiLeaks helped the Tunisians mm. when Arab Spring was going on. Mm. You know, it helped people understand, Americans understand what their government was doing in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah. Such vital information. Yeah. But the US has been hounding Assange for many years now, uh, especially the past two where this case has been going on. Mm. And they have filed appeals. So uh, this is just one of those, you know, when the United States says protect democracy, it basically means, uh, you know, it basically means we're going to be talking about democracy for those countries we don't like. Yeah. Okay. We're not really bothered about those countries. We're not bothered about Saudi Arabia. Mm. The US is not bothered about Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Because we have activists like Lajin al Hatlul who spent years in prison. The United States is not bothered about the UAE, mm. whose royals have used uh, Pegasus, apparently, or Morocco for that matter, mm. which is attacking a close ally of the US, which has filed a case against uh, newspapers for reporting on Pegasus. Yeah. Or for that matter, Israel, <laughs> yeah. who, where Pegasus was manufactured. Yeah. Right. So the US is not bothered about. Uh, you know, any of this. Mm. So when it says it wants to promote democracy, we have to be very clear that it basically wants to use democracy as some kind of a stick to beat certain countries with. Yeah. It wants to use democracy as a stick to beat Cuba with, despite the fact that, you know, Cuba is a country where people's participation, where the connect between the political system and the people is much, much higher. Mm. Yeah. It wants to use democracy as a stick to beat Venezuela with, which has mm. had about, I think, 20 rounds of elections in the past uh, decade and a half or so. Right. But it will not talk about democracy when it comes to its own allies. Yeah. So highly, highly uh, <laughs> hypocritical for lack of a better word. Mm. All right. Yeah, there you have it. Uh, El Dios Dinero <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and that does it for this edition of Daily Debrief. You've been watching People's Dispatch. Check out all more, of, uh, more details on all of these stories on our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on social media. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.